everyone. Welcome back to CBS News. I'm Michelle Miller. And I'm Elaine Quijano. Here's a quick look at some of the top stories we're following. Congressman Steve Scalise and Jim Jordan are each addressing fellow Republicans today on why they should be the next Speaker of the House. Former President Donald Trump has formally endorsed Jordan, saying the Ohio lawmaker is strong on crime, borders, the military, and the Second Amendment. Plus, the nation's employers added 336,000 jobs in September. The number is nearly twice Wall Street's expectations, leading many investors to believe the Federal Reserve will continue to raise interest rates in an effort to curb inflation. And United Auto Workers President Sean Fain this afternoon said, quote, significant progress has been made in contract talks with Detroit's big three automakers, Ford, General Motors, and Stellantis. Fain also said the union would hold off on expanding its strike for now. Well, former President Donald Trump has endorsed Ohio Republican Congressman Jim Jordan for House Speaker. In a social media post overnight, he wrote, Jordan, quote, will be a great speaker. The House Judiciary Committee chair and House Majority Leader Steve Scalise are both vying for the gavel. They are meeting with key groups of lawmakers today as each attempts to build support for their bids. CBS News congressional correspondent Scott McFarland joins us now. Scott, uh, how much does of an impact does, does the former president's endorsement really have on this race? It has some impact, but not the type of transcendent impact it has in most Republican-only races or in a Republican primary, because there's a pretty broad coalition that one of these candidates has to build, and it would include a number of Republicans who represent districts won by President Biden. It includes a number of Main Street center-right Republicans who may not be moved by a threat of a revolt from voters back home if they don't support Donald Trump's endorsed candidate. So it can show some momentum, but it's not a silver bullet. That's critical at this moment because there has to be a new speaker selected before they open the doors <laughs> and turn back on the lights in the House chamber, which remains paralyzed again today and perilously so as we come closer to that November 17th deadline to keep the government open. What, Scott, the, the lights are really off? <laughs> And the shades are pulled. Oh, it, wow. It's an indefinite really? recess, which many, many school children would love. <laughs> um, you know, Scott, it's really interesting to think about these two figures, Jim Jordan and Steve Scalise, because it's not as though they're unknowns, right? They are well-known figures among House Republicans. So how critical is it for them to each be having these meetings with lawmakers? Stumping. They have yeah. some similar jurisdictions, too. I mean, you've got conservatives who've backed both Steve Scalise and Jim Jordan in their other pursuits. Jim Jordan is potentially the most ardent and vocal supporter and loyalist to Donald Trump. This endorsement wasn't a surprise. He is on the House Judiciary Committee where he leads investigations into President Biden. He is a Fox News fixture. He's got a national profile. Steve Scalise is a member of leadership perhaps the most prolific fundraiser other than Kevin McCarthy in the House Republican Conference. He also is a national figure, sadly, for what's happened to him in 2017 and now. He survived an assassination attempt in that shooting at the ball field in 2017, and now he is undergoing treatment for blood cancer. Steve Scalise has a unique biography, but also has a history of building coalitions among House Republicans. But neither of them is a shoe-in to win those potential swing voters in the conference who represent suburban New York City, suburban Philadelphia, suburban Los Angeles, who may have to find some bridge to supporting either Steve Scalise or Jim Jordan. It may not be intuitive for them. Yeah, a very, very Congress we're talking about here. Scott McFarland, thank you. U.S. job growth soared far beyond economists' expectations last month. This comes in spite of high interest rates implemented by the Federal Reserve in an effort to cool inflation. The Labor Department revealed today U.S. employers added 336,000 jobs in September. Unemployment remained steady at 3.8 percent. This unexpectedly strong jobs report follows the Federal Reserve opting not to raise interest rates last month. Nonetheless, the federal funds rate remains at its highest level in more than two decades. President Biden touted the report in a speech at the White House today. It's no accident. It's Bidenomics. We're growing the economy from the middle out, the bottom up, not the top down. 
Colby Smith joins us now. She is a U.S. economics editor for the Financial Times. Colby, welcome. So the number of jobs added doubled mm -hmm. some economists' expectations. Why does hiring remain so robust? So I think it really all comes down to the consumer. At this point, Americans are still spending and they're spending strongly. Um, they have stockpiles of savings amassed since the um, start of the pandemic, really. Um, those reach record levels. And, and yes, they're being drawn down to a certain extent, but they're still quite elevated. And so when you have a strong consumer um, spending um, um, still quite robustly, it leads to a situation where employers um, you know, still have to hire. And that's really what we saw in the September report. There's just really no shortage of demand across the labor market. Now, the Federal Reserve wants to see a slowing of the labor market as officials fight to bring down that inflation. So should Americans actually be concerned about the strength of this jobs report? So that's a big question that we hear every time um, there's a piece of strong economic data. Does the U.S. Econo uh, economy's resilience, does that mean the Fed needs to do more? Um, I think at a certain point in um, the tightening cycle, that very much would have been the case. But this is also happening at a time where we've seen pretty seismic moves in government bond markets. So U.S. borrowing costs have spiked um, quite dramatically over the past couple of uh, weeks, really, um, since September. And um, essentially what that can do in some way is offset the need for the Fed to do more um, in the end in terms of interest rate increases. Um, the bond market is kind of doing the Fed's work for it. Um, so that's what's making um, you know, the upcoming meeting more of an open question than I think it otherwise would have been um, had this report just been kind of in its uh, on its own. Well, we should note that this massive job growth uh, is really coming at a time of immense uncertainty for the U.S. government. Is it only a matter of time, some might be wondering, before we see the economy sharply decline? So that's the speculation, and we see it when, oh, with uh, regards to, um, you know, certain pandemic relief programs, um, you know, lapsing. Uh, we have student loan debt repayments uh, restarting again. Uh, child, uh, child care federal subsidies um, are also ending. Um, there's this worker strike, uh, auto worker strike, uh, as well as a number of other headwinds from, um, you know, including spiking energy prices. So there's a lot um, to be concerned about, I think, um, about the trajectory of the economy going forward. And still, we haven't seen the full effects of the Fed's past actions to date in terms of its interest rate increases. So taking it all together, um, there's a lot of expectation that the economy is going to slow from here. Um, but that being said, um, people have been consistently surprised by the strength of the economy, and it could well mean that that slowdown is just delayed uh, further into the future. If I recall correctly, it's been the last two years we've been waiting to see a big recession hit, yeah. and it has yet to, to, to really hit. Yeah, and consumer spending, as, as you know, really mm. has been a driver, right? We'll see how long that keeps up. Colby right. Smith, Colby, thanks so much for your reporting and analysis. We appreciate it. The Norwegian Nobel Committee has decided to award the Nobel Peace Prize for 2023 to Nargis Mohammadi for her fight against the oppression of women in Iran. This year's Nobel Peace Prize has been awarded to imprisoned Iranian activist Nargis Mohammadi. The Norwegian Nobel Committee lauded her as a freedom fighter who has campaigned for women's rights for decades. Mohammadi is currently being detained in Tehran's notorious even prison. She has been imprisoned 13 times and sentenced to more than 30 years combined. Despite being in jail, she was instrumental in organizing protests over the last year following the death of a 22-year-old woman in Iranian police custody. CBS News foreign correspondent Imtiaz Tayeb joins us now. Imtiaz, good to see you. So talk about her activism in the country over the last few decades and what she has meant to women fighting oppression. 
Elaine, Michelle, so good to be with you. I mean, Nargis Mohammadi is an incredible woman, an incredible force of nature, it has to be said. She is the deputy head of the Defenders of Human Rights Center, which is a non-governmental organization led by Shireen Abadi, who you may remember as the 2003 Nobel Peace Prize laureate, who won her prize for efforts to promote democracy and human rights, especially for women and children in Iran. As for Mohammadi, she began her career as a campaigner and activist when she was still a student over three decades ago. And in an op-ed published last month in the New York Times, while she was still in prison, she wrote on September the 16th, which was the first anniversary of the death in custody of 22-year-old Masa Amini that galvanized those mass protests across Iran last year, Mohammadi wrote, my goal back then was to fight religious tyranny, which along with tradition and social customs has led to the deep repression of women in Iran, adding, the more they, Iran's theocratic government, punish me, the more they take away from me, the more determined I become to fight until we achieve democracy and freedom and nothing else. Make it Mohammadi a deeply meaningful figure for many Iranians, especially Iranian women who want to be freed from the diktats of the oppressive regime. Guys. MTS, Mohammadi is, is still detained in, in that prison that we spoke of. Do we even know if she's aware that she's been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize? Michelle, the short answer is we just don't know for sure. But what we do know is that fighting for change has cost Nargis Mohammadi her career. She's a trained engineer. But perhaps most painfully for her, it's seen her separated from her husband and her children, including her twin teenage daughters. But as we've been saying, Mohammadi is Iran's most prominent human rights and women rights campaigner, who's already serving, as we've been saying, a 10-year jail sentence for what the regime says is, quote, spreading anti-state propaganda. Propaganda. But her current imprisonment is hardly her first encounter with Iran's harsh approach to dissent. As we've been saying, she's been jailed 13 times and convicted five times over the past three decades, which means in total she's been sentenced to 31 years in prison. Oh. 31 years. Mm -hmm. Now, Mohammadi's most recent incarnation, or incarceration rather, began when she was detained back in 2021 after attending a memorial for a person killed in nationwide protests in 2019 that were sparked by an increase in gasoline prices, which is clear that she's been in the forefront of protests in Iran. Guys. You know, uh, Imtiaz, I can't help but think about uh, in the past year we've seen on social media just the sheer bravery of some of these protesters mm. that we have seen. And, you know, that's really captured the world's attention. I'm wondering, what does today's award mean for activists' ongoing struggle in that country? Yeah. You're absolutely right, Elaine. I mean, those protests have just been extraordinary and have captured the world's attention. But as we've been saying, Mohammadi has already was in detention when those protesters erupted. And so you have to really keep in mind that she is somebody who is determined to keep the story of Iran's women forefront to the minds of people, even though she's behind bars. Guys. MTS Tayyab, we thank you. We are going to take a short break. Stay with us. You're streaming CBS News Always On. Well, as we head into the fall season, that means it is time to update your wardrobe. But for millions of Americans, buying new clothes just might not be in the budget. That's right. We're looking into how you can stay on trend without spending a fortune and what pieces everyone should have in their closets. Okay, so I was already telling you that style-wise, I always need more than a little help because I have no vision, so I'm glad you guys are here. Um, first, I'm going to start with what women are wearing. Give us a sense of the trends this fall. Well, I am so excited about this season because if I had to distill the trends into one word, it is sophisticated. It's very timeless. It's buttoned up. It's polished. Okay. And we just published our Vogue shopping fall trend guide, and all of the trends that we included were pulled from street style and runway and celebrity style, and they all seem to bolster this idea of timeless sophistication. Okay. For so, example. For example, the first trend is a non-trend trend. It's this idea of wardrobe classics, things that you invest in and will have several seasons in your uh, in rotation. Right blazers, tailoring, things that are incredibly classic, not too trendy. You can have like a blazer with a little bit of a twist, yeah. but we saw the return of the cinched waist blazer oh. after several seasons of a the very boxy. boxy. Yes. Yeah, which doesn't work for me because I didn't don't, work for I'm me short. Either. I just, yeah, I look like I'm wearing my dad's clothes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so we have this idea of this return to incredibly timeless, elegant pieces. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, something like a blazer is a really easy thing to do and incorporate into your wardrobe. 
wardrobe. Yeah. But another, um, another element of the fall trends that I really love is this idea that a lot of the trends are... Um, not so much silhouette, but like color and metallic. So ah. we saw red was a huge trend. Right. Um, on TikTok, it was coined tomato girl red. <laughs> yeah, um, because it's not like a, like a blood red or it's actually a red that I really like because it has a little tinge of orange yes, and a spark I'm sporting to it. it on my I nail. was saying that, I can see it on your lips. <laughs> I'm yeah. a big fan of tomato girl. <laughs> Um, so that's a trend that really took off this summer and it's carried over into fall and how I love to see it incorporated in fall mm -hmm. is um, in knitwear. I think like a really great gorgeous v-neck cashmere sweater mm -hmm. in this tomato girl red mm -hmm. is um, perfect for fall. Another color that is really trending right now is gray. I know the yeah. idea of gray, like you don't want a gray day, but yeah. we, we, we love some gray knitwear. Um, and uh, some of the brands that are really pushing this is Prada. Oh. Prada is like, the, she's the queen of gray, right. but it's a very easy trend to incorporate into your fall yes. wardrobe. And you can layer, layer, layer. And you might um, already have it, which is amazing. Yeah, Talking that's about true, shopping too. your own closet. <laughs> that's a great way to save money. Where are we gonna get to b budget tips? What about men? What are men wearing? Yeah, I think we're seeing a really great return to elegance with men. I think uh, ties Same are thing. back in a big way, which huh? is great. You know, I think that, yeah, the idea of cinching up a tie feels cool again in some right. ways, right? Where after we've had, you know, a few years of just wearing sweats during the pandemic, it's like people are looking forward to dressing up in, in a big way again. Right. And sweater vests are really cool right now. They're just like a really fun, easy layer. You know, it's a great way to get some color or pattern into a look. And yeah. you can throw it on with a t-shirt and jeans and it like kind of dresses things up a little bit. Yeah. It looks really cool under a suit. It's like a, it's like a nice way to mix up, a, you know, a, a sort of tweedy suit that you're wearing every day. Yeah. And um, yeah, and then we're seeing uh, bigger silhouettes with men, right? So uh, mm. that's both in terms of jeans. I think, uh, you know, the sort of the skinny, slim jean era is long past us. And now we're sort of seeing things widening out, which has been really cool. Yeah. And, um, and then we're seeing that in shirts as well. So I think uh, a casual shirt, like a big white button down is just like a great thing that every man oh, can own. You know, you just, yeah, you just buy it a little oversized and you know, it's a little rumpled. You throw right. it on on a Saturday morning yeah. or just like, you know, like a Wednesday date night and you know, you look a little put together, but still kind of casual. Yeah. It's, it's a, yeah, it's a really good And so, you know, balance. I know in your list, metallics, layering metallics was like kind of like that one element of like, spark a little bit different and i feel like you're wearing <laughs> right. like that other if you want to like be a little push it a little bit you got the the cords the corduroy yeah, but it's yeah. a whole suit no for sure i do love a corduroy suit yeah. and i think it's like yeah again that sort of perfect mix of it's dressy and it feels right for the office or for a wedding but yeah. at the same time yeah you're right it's like it's like very fall it's very rough and tumble you can kind of yeah. feel like you can beat it up a little bit and it, and, and it still looks good <laughs> yeah. so yeah and you okay. can wear the blazer on its own or the pants on their That's own right, right. Yeah, exactly <laughs> um so let's talk budget i mean yeah, yeah. you want to update your wardrobe but you can't do it every season so how do you Get some key pieces so you mm -hmm. look good, you feel good, but you don't break the bank. Any tips? Okay, so my first tip is to go secondhand. I'm the biggest mm -hmm. proponent of shopping vintage, shopping secondhand. It's good for the environment, it's too. It's good for the environment, mm -hmm. and it's so easy to do online these days. There are amazing companies like The Real Real. I'm sure we're all big fans of The Real Real. Yep. Um, and another company I love is Dora Mar. Great for online consignment shopping. So the first is go consignment. The second is think about cost per wear. So if you want to... Um, update your fall wardrobe, pick something that you're going to be wearing consistently throughout the season. So yeah. splurge on the coat. You can wear the same coat every single day mm -hmm. to the office. No one's gonna look at you like, oh, is Lila outfit repeating? That's right, not right, gonna happen. Right. So um, choose That's items good. that you're gonna be able to get a larger cost per wear from. All right, and you? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think it's it's about you know sort of buying better and buying less. And yeah. and if you're, you know, if you're concerned about trends, you can get a trendy piece here or there that works into your greater wardrobe and just makes sort sort of make sure that it, it works with everything else that you already own, you right. know, and it's just about um, keeping a consistency to your style. That's smart shopping because right. that mm -hmm. way you still look like updated, right. but you don't you don't have to like update your um, wages. I don't exactly. know. I was trying to <laughs> something zingy. It wasn't right. working out. Uh, anyways, uh, uh, Lila, um, no, did I say it right, Lila? You did. Okay, you and Young, thank you so much. Absolutely, thank thanks for having us. Yeah. U.S. drug maker Moderna plans to begin late-stage trials of its dual COVID flu vaccine with the aim of gaining regulatory approval in 2025. This comes after early-stage trials showed the combined dose was as effective as separate shots. Our Anne-Marie Green spoke to Dr. Stephanie Silvera, a professor of public health and the associate dean for research and faculty development at Montclair State University on CBS News Mornings earlier today. So where I grew up, you call this a twofer, 
help us understand why this would be such a big deal? So anytime we can make um, adhering to our public health recommendations easier and more accessible, that's a win. We know that sometimes having to return more than once to get vaccines um, are not really always an option for most people. And let's face it, nobody wants to get shot more than once. So if we can combine two vaccines into one around the same time with the same seasonality, that's going to be a win in terms of public health. So explain to us what a late stage trial looks like and is 2025, uh, you know, a reasonable timeline. Right. So the way that um, these clinical trials work is that you have these early phases, one and two, that look for safety first and then efficacy. And those are typically with somewhere um, from 15 to 50 or up to 100 patients. The later trials include hundreds of patients that want to look at whether or not these new treatments or new vaccines are going to be an improvement over what we have. So it's not good enough for them to be good, they really need to be better and they need to show a reason for why this is an improvement. These do take a good amount of time, but we have a basis upon which we are already working. So these aren't new vaccines in terms of where we were with a COVID vaccine. This is a matter of finding the best combination that will have the essentially most, most bang for our buck. Um, you know, you talked about anything that makes it a little easier for people to access health care is always a good thing. Um, you know, during the public health emergency, you could get vaccinated and boosters pretty easily. You could be tested very easily. That's all gone away. But COVID clearly has not. Are there communities that are being left out in this post pandemic world? Yes, and unfortunately, that is not new. I think COVID highlighted a lot of the health inequities and disparities that are seen in this country. So even if we look at flu, which we're all familiar with, um, Black and Hispanic populations have persistently lower influenza vaccination rates compared to their white counterparts. So we're talking about 39 to 37% versus almost 50%. And we've actually seen that persist with the COVID boosters now. And as they are less and less available, and as the government is not paying for it as freely, I expect that those disparities are likely to be exacerbated if there is not a concerted effort to address them. You know, during the pandemic, we talked so much about sort of inequality and inequities in healthcare, and I had hoped that the post-pandemic world would somehow address some of that stuff, and it looks like we're back to some of our same bad habits. Um, Stephanie Silvera, thank you. Thank you. Coming up, it's CBS News Weekender. Just months after his presidency, former President Trump allegedly disclosed sensitive information about U.S. nuclear submarines. What more we know about this developing story. Plus, welcome to Fat Bear Week. <laughs> Voting is underway right now. We'll show you some of Alaska's top contenders who are packing on most pounds ahead of winter. It's called hibernation. <laughs> CBS News Weekender is next. You're streaming. CBS News.